Welcome to my channel. Today, I will share with you the story of Tom. His wife cheated on him with a bank loan department manager, leading to the breakdown of their marriage. Please subscribe to our channel, and let's begin the story. I have a gentle and virtuous wife, as well as a pair of smart and lovely children, which makes me immerse in happiness every day. However, my wife has always been secretive about her phone, often lying on the bed, stretching out her beautiful legs and laughing while staring at her phone. Her fingers move swiftly on the keyboard. I suspect she must be chatting with someone, but whenever I approach, she quickly closes the screen, not letting me see any information. I always feel that there are secrets hidden in my wife's phone. I have asked her about it, and she said it's a colleague. If I continue to ask, she will hide her phone and come over to me with endearment, making it difficult for me to press further. After all, her charm makes me forget all doubts and immerse myself in the sweetness of her affection. Unfortunately, this blissful immersion does not last long. Gradually, my wife began to refuse intimacy with me. There was even a time when she kicked me off the bed and cursed me as a waste. I found this unacceptable, and my curiosity about the secrets in my wife's phone grew stronger. I felt certain that something was wrong with her. However, every time I became suspicious, my wife would approach me with a seductive voice in my ear, followed by an experience that left me extremely satisfied, leaving me at a loss. Gradually, I calmed down. After all, my wife and I have a lovely pair of children, and our relationship has always been good. I felt I shouldn't doubt my wife. Even though her lipstick shade changed and there were red marks on her buttocks as if she had been slapped whenever she returned home, I chose to trust her. Until one day, when my wife was taking a shower, I saw a message on her phone that had been left outside. It read, Baby, I'm waiting for you in room 801, my mind exploded instantly. The incident troubled me, and I didn't know how to ask my wife about this message. When I hesitated, my wife told me she had to go out for something, and she dressed up carefully, wearing black stockings. I instantly became suspicious. Pretending to agree, I secretly followed her. I saw her entering a hotel. At that moment, my blood rushed to my head, and I followed her quietly until she entered room 801 of the Caesar Hotel, where a well-dressed man in a suit entered along with her. I was close to losing it, but helpless. I grew up in a rural farmer's family and came to study in New York, where I met my wife at school. She was fair-skinned, beautiful, and came from a well-off family. Her father held a position in government and had helped me tremendously. Without my father-in-law's patronage, I couldn't have achieved what I have today. Standing at the door of room 801, I was in a state of confusion. I wanted to burst in and beat the adulterers, but ultimately, reason overcame impulse. The consequences of rashly barging in to catch the cheaters were something I couldn't bear. I asked the waiter to open room 802, where I lay on the bed separated by only a wall from room 801, listening to their passionate voices. The seductive moans and whispers of my wife left me utterly desolate. Recalling the memories with her, remembering her appearance in my arms, and then looking at the present, my heart turned to dead ashes, and the passion instantly retreated. Next, a sudden thought occurred to me, my children. Their practiced actions must have been going on for quite some time. So, are my smart and lovely children really mine? Being a very traditional person, even though I knew my wife was unfaithful, I did not want my children to be the product of her betrayal. However, just as I hesitated on what to do, a loud noise suddenly came from next door. I heard the man laughing and saying, Tom, that fool, still doesn't know he is raising my kid for me, huh? In an instant, my mind went blank. At that moment, I didn't know if I should jump from the eighth floor to end it all. It wasn't until they both left the hotel, and the night had grown deep, that I slowly left the hotel room and returned to what should have been my haven but was now a place colder than an ice cave, my home. My wife, seeing me desolate, seemed to sense unease and came over to touch my hand, asking if I was facing work troubles or feeling unhappy. She reassured me that it was okay, she could handle it. Handle it? I coldly shook my head, asking if she intended to handle it with the help of that deceiver. 
I silently walked back to the bedroom and locked the door. Naturally. My wife sensed something was wrong. She knocked persistently, called me, but I neither answered nor opened the door. Now, all I wanted to know was whether my children were really mine. The next day, after my wife left for work, I prepared hair samples from my son and daughter and went to the hospital's paternity testing center for a DNA test. The results showed that my son was mine, but my daughter was not. I was shattered. The effort I had put into my daughter, Jennifer, was no less than that for my son. Due to her young age, I had taken extra care of her, indulging her with tasty treats and fun activities. Yet, she turned out to not be my biological child. Upon leaving the hospital, I felt lost. It was as if the devil had drained my spirit, and I aimlessly wandered, feeling crazed and purposeless. I walked the empty streets all night, the cold autumn wind chilling my skin to the bone, while my heart grew ever colder. At that moment, I decided that my wife must pay a painful price, and I wanted revenge. This thought led me to recall the moans I heard in room 802 that day, bringing a sense of secret delight at my wife's unwitting betrayal spreading through my body. She didn't know that I knew, but I knew that she knew. Wasn't this a meaningful revelation, the next day, upon returning home, I had become a different person. Outwardly, I remained the silent and loving husband as usual, but inwardly, my heart had changed. My wife's infidelity had awakened a dark side within me. In ordinary circumstances, upon knowing that a daughter was not biologically related, one would favor the son even more. However, I did the opposite. Instead, I began showering Jennifer with even more love and attention. Every day, I told her stories, played games with her, took her to school and back, and bought her favorite hamburgers. Of course, my kindness towards her was part of my revenge plan. After continuing this for a period, my wife, seeing no other actions from me, seemingly regained her composure, reverting to her queenly airs and began to treat me with disdain. Inwardly, I chuckled coldly, silently bearing everything. In my revenge plan, the more my wife acts all high and mighty now, the more miserable her future will be. My wife mentioned her brother was coming over to our house tonight and asked me to buy some lamb, so we could have a lively meal together with lamb chops. I happily agreed. However, as soon as she turned around to leave, a sinister smile crept onto my face. My wife's mother holds a high position in a company, and her father is a health official. However, her brother turned out to be a street bum due to his lazy and indulgent nature. Due to his frequent participation in gambling activities, their once well-off family started drifting apart. Over the years, apart from secretly repaying his debts, likely preventing him from being hunted down for money, her brother, Steve, never showed any sign of remorse. Brother-in-law, do you know this website? Just give me a dollar, and I guarantee you can earn 20000 Steve tried to pitch those gambling websites to me as soon as he walked in. Steve, it's best to steer clear of these things if you can. While your sister is not back yet, I have some secret funds here. Let's see how much debt we can clear. After saying this, I transferred $5,000 to him. Steve seemed moved by my actions, his mouth opened, as if choking back his emotions. I'm going out to buy lamb. Let's have a drink later, I said, turning to leave. Giving money to Steve was actually part of my revenge plan. I knew that gamblers don't quit until they lose everything. During my absence buying lamb, he might blow all 5,000. But I felt exceptionally pleased, even imagining the future confrontation between the siblings as a result of my actions. It felt satisfying. Instead of buying lamb, I went to the Caesar Hotel, booked room 801, and informed the attendant that I wanted the room for a month, tipping him $5,000. In exchange, I asked the attendants to charge my wife the regular room rate if she brought someone there and to keep the secret. Of course, the attendant could keep the extra income. This backdoor deal was clearly understood by the attendant, who promptly arranged everything and ushered me into the room. After the attendant left, I set up a tiny camera at the bedside that could be monitored through my phone. During this time, 
I had already traced my wife's activities. They usually booked room 801 at the Caesar Hotel, likely due to its proximity to her workplace and suitable conditions. As for why room 801, I speculated that the number must hold some special significance. On the way home, I bought a bottle of wine. Upon arriving home, Steve's crestfallen expression told me that the 5,000 had likely gone to waste, but I pretended not to know. I had him help me with preparing dinner, pretending to be on amicable terms with him. After picking up the children from school, I called my wife, advised her to stay safe on her way back from work, and then artfully arranged a bunch of roses on the table. Staring at these individuals, who were simultaneously closest yet furthest from me, I couldn't help but smile. My wife complained about the expensive wine I had bought, to which I replied that since Steve had come all this way, we should have a grand moment as a family. As we reached halfway through the meal, she received a phone call and informed me that her friend needed help, excusing herself to go out for a while and encouraging us to continue eating. I perfectly knew my wife's intentions as she prepared to leave the house. Just before she left, I grabbed her arm and said, Wife, when you're out spending money on shopping, make sure to get some clothes for yourself. After my wife left for a while, I estimated that she should have arrived at room 801, so I went alone to the bathroom. In there. I opened the surveillance video and, as expected, saw my wife at room 801. Watching her in her seductive and alluring state, my heart turned icy cold to the extreme. I watched their intimate scene for a long half hour and saved the video. Outside, Steve was pushing me, but I just mentioned a stomach ache. By the time I finished, Steve had left, but I received a text from him which said, Brother-in-law, thank you. Seeing this message, I smiled. Steve was a part of my revenge plan, and his gratitude would become my sharpest tool in retaliating against my wife. Then, I played with Jennifer. I took her to the amusement park, played hide-and-seek with her, bought her expensive ice creams, treated her like a little princess to make her dependent on me. However, if I were to divorce my wife, I would never take her back. I would let her live with her mother and watch them fight and hate each other, sparking relentless conflict. The thought of it gave me immense satisfaction. By the way, I earned extra money online. In front of my wife, I handed over all my earnings to her, making her believe it was my total income. After her infidelity, I attempted to shift assets, but consulting a lawyer revealed it wouldn't work. After much deliberation, I decided to use a different method, taking out 20% of my income for household use, investing the remainder in a growth-type insurance policy for my son. Despite the substantial income, I divulged only a small portion to my wife, who never suspected a thing. As a rural native with parents lacking income, the house and car were bought by my in-laws. Therefore, I had no debt obligations. My wife returned close to midnight, reigniting my vengeful thoughts. Embracing her waist, I touched her legs affectionately, receiving physical comfort despite my inner contempt for her. The guilt-ridden response of my wife justified her actions, and she desired to offer me physical solace. Her adultery had transformed me entirely, awakening the darkest corner of my heart. I charged ahead without seeing her as a person. After my wife fell asleep, I opened my phone and reviewed the incriminating evidence. Watching her flirtatious movements, my heart turned as cold as steel. The following day, which was a Saturday, my wife claimed to be working overtime. I knew she was going on another rendezvous but pretended otherwise. Over half an hour after her departure, I observed her on the bed in room 801 through the surveillance video on my phone. Feeling her allure through the screen, I saved the footage and proceeded with my next step. I spent $20,000 in a shopping mall, gifting my mother-in-law a massage chair and purchasing a box of cigars for my father-in-law. Despite the hefty expense, I didn't flinch. My in-laws, though traditional, had been supportive and hadn't discriminated against me. A third of the gesture was to thank them, and the remainder was geared towards revenge. Tom, you have bought all the electrical appliances for the house. You have children to raise and your wages are not high. You shouldn't buy expensive items like this in the future. My mother-in-law mentioned the set of computers, air conditioners, 
and the rotating dining table all the items I purchased for them after my wife's affair. Though she said those words, I could see the joy in her eyes. Handing the box of cigars to my father-in-law, I skillfully unpacked the massage chair and positioned it appropriately. Mom and Dad, your necks aren't in great shape. This massage chair is meant to help with neck problems. Money is not the issue. I am grateful for everything you have done. Without you, I wouldn't have survived here, I said emotionally, trying to sound choked up. Mom, why don't you try it out? Is it comfortable? Tom. You are much better than that spendthrift Steve, my emotive mother-in-law spoke with tears in her eyes. I held back a smile to cover up any hint of my cold demeanor. Brother-in-law, you're here. Steve couldn't resist interrupting, entering the room. The ambience was broken by his unexpected arrival. While my mother-in-law sat on the massage chair with a stony expression, my father-in-law's face fell instantly upon seeing Steve. Without a word, he turned away in anger. The scene was absurd. Steve has returned, I quickly announced, breaking the awkward tension. Steve had been living in rented accommodation all this time. The money I had given him to repay his debts had resulted in a financial downfall for my in-laws. Steve rarely came home, and given my experience with him, his return surely indicated an ulterior motive. Sure enough. Steve informed us that he had been in a relationship with a girl for six months and planned to get married. She only required a house and a car. Hearing Steve's words, my father-in-law was infuriated. The money we saved for years to buy you a house, you squandered it all. And now you have the nerve to ask me for money to buy a house and a car? Where do you expect me to find that money? Steve, who had always been pampered, was very displeased at his father's outburst. Shouting back at his father, if you can buy a house for my sister, why can't you buy one for me? Steve's disrespectful tone prompted my mother-in-law to raise her hand, attempting to hit him, but I quickly intervened. Mom, calm down. Steve is right. He's preparing to get married now and is turning over a new leaf. You two can rest easy. Steve is my own brother, and I'll handle the house and car situation. I finished with a smile, as an evil thought sparked in my mind. Later, I bluntly told my wife about my plan to mortgage the house to provide a down payment for Steve. Unexpectedly, my words triggered her immediate anger. Tom, I understand you giving money to Steve for personal purchases, but mortgaging our house to buy one for him? How could you even think of that? You are aware of his irresponsible behavior. Have you lost your mind? My wife stared at me, confused. Tom, whose brother is Steve? Why are you more concerned about him than me? Taking my wife's hand, I earnestly explained, if your parents hadn't bought this house for us, we wouldn't be living so comfortably. And despite Steve's faults, he is still their son. Now that he's in trouble, who else can help him but us? After saying this, I felt a sneer forming in my heart, but I maintained the same servile demeanor, gazing up at her in a lowly manner. Unable to retort, my wife hesitated to speak out. I knew that half of my plan had succeeded. The property deed was solely in my wife's name, and the house legally belonged to her, not me. So, mortgaging the house for Steve had no impact on my share of the assets. Knowing that the mortgaged money would go to a gambling addict like Steve, I couldn't help but laugh inwardly, realizing he would never change his gambling habits. I could close my eyes and still predict the outcome of this situation, it would all end in disaster. While the loan from the mortgage can be used to pay off Steve, how are you planning to repay the mortgage? My wife posed another question. Darling, I'll have a good talk with him about it. Either Steve repays it, or we, along with our parents, will take over the debt, I assured her, giving her shoulder a pat. Wife, once Steve gets married and has someone to look after him, we won't have to worry anymore. Helpless and sighing, my wife reluctantly agreed with my proposal. Given my wife's cashier role and familiarity with bank personnel, she was the one to handle mortgage issues, not me. And I preferred it that way to avoid any effects on my credit. Besides, 
considering Steve's irresponsible nature, his actions might bring trouble upon their whole family. On the day of the loan application, I drove Steve to the bank. Observing the playful gestures and slightly flirtatious discourse between my wife and the home loan officer, I realized there might be more between them. Before Steve lit the cigarette I had given him, a wave of uncontrollable laughter overtook me. Brother-in-law, what's so funny? Steve was taken aback, looking at me with surprise. I quickly composed myself, although internally, I felt jubilant. Nothing, just in a good mood, I assured him. I've sorted out the house now, all that's left is the car. Cars are easy to deal with. I'll get you one for your wedding. Thank you, brother-in-law. You're too kind to me. We're family, no need for formalities. Just be more assertive in the future, and don't let mom and dad worry. I promise, brother-in-law. I'll turn over a new leaf. Observing Steve's smug expression, I couldn't help but smile. However, our reasons for smiling were vastly different. The loan is for 30 years, with a monthly installment of $2,000. You better get a proper job to repay it, or we'll lose the house, my wife instructed Steve. After signing the document, my wife gave him a stern lecture. Got it, sis. Why do you talk as much as mom? Steve, getting impatient. Stuffed the contract into his bag. Helpless, my wife shook her head, then turned to me, Tom, you go home and pick up the kids, I need to have a business discussion with the bank manager, Alexander, and some company matters, as soon as my wife mentioned the bank manager, she adjusted her hair, signaling the imminent outcome. I found myself grabbing Alexander's hand, feeling a camaraderie with him. Alexander, I entrust my wife's company matters to you. Please offer her more help and attention to avoid her being scolded by her boss when she returns to the office, I said, squeezing his hand gently. The twinkle in Alexander's eye spoke volumes. Laughing incited my joy in deciphering others' thoughts, I informed Steve on the way back that if the repayment became an issue, he should call me for assistance. Steve expressed immense gratitude, pledging to repay my kindness when he succeeded. Internally, I scoffed at the idea a gambler never changes their ways. When my wife returned, even the shade of her lipstick had changed. Unconcerned with these details, I went to the bathroom and opened the video. It's room 801 again, the same bed, but the male protagonist has changed. Surprised by my prolonged absence, my wife actually took the initiative to do my laundry, which was somewhat unexpected. Just returning from outside, what else could it be but a guilty conscience, Tom, do you think Steve can really change his bad habits? You have to believe in Steve. The wanderer returns, and Steve has sworn. Besides, with a girlfriend guiding him now, it should be fine. Let's hope so. I hope from now on, my little brother can make me worry-free. It will. Everything will be fine, I replied casually as I removed my wife's lingerie. Are you comfortable and ready to sleep? That's impossible, as I haven't had enough fun yet. I was acting wildly, causing her to yell in pain. Strangely, I derived a perverse sense of joy from it. I knew Steve had issues, but I never anticipated his antics would escalate this quickly. Despite signing the loan contract just half a month ago, he managed to secure a second loan using the same contract. The second loan was only 50000 but in less than an hour, he lost it all. To cover his losses, he concocted false contracts and managed to obtain 150000 from a loan company, only to gamble it away and be left with nothing. Steve, didn't I tell you? Didn't we agree that you wouldn't gamble anymore? Why don't you listen? What happened to the promises you made to me and your sister? I controlled my inner joy, able to put on a reproachful facade. However, I couldn't help but think, well done, Steve. Brother-in-law, I beg you. Just lend me 2,000, I need it. With this, I can turn things around immediately. Brother-in-law, trust me, I've learned his tricks. No, you can't touch this anymore. This could harm both you and others, I cannot let you gamble anymore. 
Not 2,000, not even 200, brother-in-law, it really is the last time. Just watch me play, please. Steve's tears and snot were flowing freely as he nearly kneeled beside me. Steve, I have the 2,000. But if it were before yesterday, I would have given it to you. But. At this point, I struck my vulnerable position with force, causing intense pain, making me slide off the chair. Subsequently, I knelt in front of Steve, aiming to play my part flawlessly for the revenge plan to succeed. Suddenly, tears gushed from my eyes. Brother-in-law, what's wrong, brother-in-law? Steve was bewildered by the sudden change in me. In Steve's eyes, I was always the caring and supportive brother-in-law. At that moment, I appeared profoundly weak, catching Steve off guard. Steve, your sister, your sister she. Your sister has fallen out of love with me, what? I sobbed, wrapping my arms around Steve's shoulders, allowing my tears and snot to flow onto his neck. No way, brother-in-law, please don't do this. What happened? Steve gently pushed me away, sounding serious, obviously, this was no joking matter. Steve, I don't want to live anymore. I love your sister so much, I considered her the only one in my life, but she. As I spoke, I burst into loud sobs. As I cried and stooped down, I forcefully slammed my head against the nearby wardrobe, causing a severe wound that bled profusely. Brother-in-law, you can't die. Think of the children, think of me. Steve panicked, stuttering in a fluster. Brother-in-law, please don't worry about it. I'll go sort things out with that scoundrel, Steve started to stand up, but I grabbed onto his clothes tightly. Steve, no, if you reveal the truth, your sister, and I won't be able to go on. I beg you, don't go, please, don't go. I knelt on the ground and began kowtowing to Steve, the blood painting the floor tiles red. Steve could only squat down and help me dress the wound, unsure of what to say. A person's life isn't that fragile, multiple wounds don't necessarily mean death. Even though I kept a cold smile inside, my face betrayed a sense of reluctance and helplessness. Steve, you have to promise me that only the two of us will know about this. I grabbed Steve's hand and pleaded, Steve, I beg you. I can't lose your sister. Although Steve was clearly uncomfortable, he hesitantly nodded in agreement. I let out a sense of relief and then took out my phone to call my wife. I put her on speakerphone and gestured to Steve to stay silent. Dear, are you finishing work soon? I have something to discuss with you. What is it? My wife's voice was calm yet tinged with weariness. Steve asked me to borrow 2000, can you approve it? I pretended to be nonchalant. Tom, do you know that Steve took a loan using the contract? And you still want to lend him money? I told you from the beginning, I didn't agree to mortgage the house for his down payment, but you insisted on coming up with these reckless ideas. How do we solve this now? My wife suddenly erupted in anger, her voice louder than ever. Even through the phone screen, I could imagine the expression on her face, and it was anything but pleasant. Panicked, I hung up the call and tried to appear concerned. Dear, who told you about this? Steve's face had started to contort. With a large mouth and a look of desperation, he clearly couldn't contain his rage. If it weren't for Alexander from the credit department telling me, I wouldn't have known. Tom, you've ruined this family completely. This family is destroyed because of you, even though I had hung up, my wife's frantic voice still resonated. Enough, enough, Steve couldn't handle it any longer, she yelled, trying to snatch the phone away from my hand. But I wasn't that foolish. In the moment she lunged to grab the phone, I had already ended the call. Grasping Steve, I pretended to console her. Steve, calm down, don't get agitated. Brother-in-law, let go of me. Alexander, that good for nothing, is really testing my patience. Now that I have a mountain of debt, I also have nothing to live for. I want to take him down with me. I want to kill him. Steve forced me aside and ran out the door. After Steve left, I couldn't contain my laughter. Steve had basically lost his mind. 
Judging by his crazed state, Alexander's future didn't seem too promising. I brewed a cup of top-notch tea, I hadn't planned to start the revenge plan this soon. But Steve's reckless behavior compelled me to act swiftly. I turned on the computer and accessed the cloud drive. Every time my wife went out, I would create a folder containing documents, photo albums, and videos. I didn't plan to send them out now but intended to do so early the next morning. The recipients would be our family chat group and common friends. I wished I could send it to more people, but I lacked the contacts. So, I had to wait for the right opportunity. After taking a short break, I headed straight to my in-law's house. With the key to my in-law's house, I sat slumped in the hallway between the sofa and coffee table. I deliberately aggravated the slightly scabbed wound, allowing fresh blood to flow. I then activated power-consuming mode on my phone, swiftly draining the battery until it shut down automatically. The sound of unsteady footsteps echoed in the staircase, followed by the conversation of a couple, seemingly discussing Steve's upcoming marriage, his ability to change his past behavior, and more. The sound of the key turning made me suddenly feel regretful. I was unsure if what I had done was right or wrong. Retaliation felt too dark and even a bit insane. Just as I began to waver internally, I overheard my mother-in-law saying, thank goodness Tom is a good husband. These words stirred a sense of determination within me regarding my revenge plan. As my mother-in-law turned on the light and saw me lying on the ground, she first gasped in surprise, then rushed over with urgency. Quick, call an ambulance, she urgently directed my father-in-law. It's all my fault, really, it's all my fault, I said while clasping my mother-in-law. I truly felt aggrieved in that moment, and all the emotions from past years flooded out in tears. What's wrong, dear? What's the matter? Being a woman, my mother-in-law was both scared and concerned by my hysterical behavior. Mom, I'm sorry about Steve. I can't find Steve anywhere. I continued playing this card, despite Steve's irresponsibility. Still, he was the son of these two elderly people, and that trump card needed to be played. Steve, this prodigal son, what has he done? My father-in-law brought over a tourniquet and towel. Surprisingly, this man who had always upheld traditional masculinity started wiping my face. Avoiding the details of Steve's irresponsibility, I informed him about my wife's infidelity and said that Steve had gone to confront Alexander after hearing his wife's phone call. What? He took another loan and went gambling again? My father-in-law dropped the wash basin in his hand upon hearing my words. Mom and Dad, we can always earn more money if we're short. But I'm scared. I fear that Steve will harm Alexander, and I'm afraid something might happen to Steve. Just then, my wife's call came through. Intended for my father-in-law. Her voice was nearly breaking as she shouted, Dad, it's terrible. Steve killed Alexander. Steve has killed someone. I could hear the hysteria in her voice through the screen, imagining that she must have been horrified by witnessing the scene. I was left feeling bewildered. Steve had killed someone? He had killed Alexander, amidst my confusion, my father-in-law suddenly collapsed, falling backward to the ground, a pallor overtaking his lips, one hand clutching his heart, shivering all over. My guilty conscience was pricked by my father-in-law's severe condition as he had always been good to me. My revenge plans didn't target him, but now he was beyond help. After being rushed to the hospital, I quietly slipped away. I didn't want to witness my father-in-law's death, but I feared that he might not make it through the day. Two days passed without me returning home, my phone remaining off the entire time. When I finally turned on my phone two days later, I learned that my father-in-law had indeed passed away. Perhaps feeling guilty about my father-in-law or realizing my revenge plan was incomplete, I dressed in a black suit and attended his funeral. Steve was unable to attend the funeral due to the ongoing court case for purposely injuring someone. As I observed the mourners in the funeral parlor, I could see my wife sobbing uncontrollably during the service, while my daughter Jennifer played nearby. She behaved exactly as I expected, 
a child who had been spoiled and didn't care about the situation, yelling and knocking over flowers. My mother-in-law hurried over to manage the situation with Jennifer, but Jennifer hit her back several times, shouting, I want daddy, I want to go home, I don't want to be here. Upon witnessing this scene, I couldn't help but feel a wave of sadness. Regardless, Jennifer was still my child. Although not by blood, I had raised her for so many years. My mother-in-law had treated me well and didn't deserve to endure this pain. However, as I was about to walk over, I suddenly saw a familiar figure. It was the dapper man from room 801, captured on camera. This man, the one who had a long-standing relationship with my wife, caused my heart to sink once again. I felt a burning sensation in my chest, a deep sense of anger and betrayal towards him. The man approached and gently embraced my wife's shoulders, saying, you have to pull yourself together and be strong. Then, as if acting nonchalantly, he casually pinched my wife's hand a couple of times. Next, he brushed his hand against my daughter's face, playfully squeezing Jennifer's cheeks. An unprecedented look of tranquility and profound love appeared on my wife's face. It was an intense love that seemed to penetrate to the core. It dawned on me, this was the first time I had seen the three of them together in a single frame. The impact of this scene was profound, shattering the last defense within me. They were a family, while I was just a fool who had been unknowingly raising someone else's child. I halted my steps, intending to leave, but instead, I opened my phone and sent out all the videos of my wife's infidelities. I then walked to the area behind the funeral hall where the elegy was being played, connected my phone to the speaker, and my wife's voice, with its ebbs and flows, filled the room. Initially, everyone was bewildered, not understanding what was happening. But when someone discovered the messages on the phone and opened them out of curiosity, the room fell into silence. Soon, all eyes turned towards my wife and the man in the black suit standing in the center of the crowd, becoming the focal point of the entire gathering. 